As we saw last time, not all American conservatives were happy with a foreign policy based on trying to democratize the world. Paleoconservative is the name given to advocates of the older conservative tradition, that of Russell Kirk and Richard Weaver, who looked back to the classical and medieval sources of our civilization and were skeptical of Woodrow Wilson-esque plans to make the world safe for democracy. Southern descendants of the agrarians, such as Mel Bradford and Clyde Wilson, were particularly well represented in this group, but so were keepers of the flame of small town, decentralized life and opponents of federal, of federal centralization, like Sam Francis. Their journal was Chronicles of Culture. Libertarians too, who'd always regarded anti-communism as a distorting force, saw the 1990s as an opportunity to dismantle the monstrous military-industrial complex. A third distinct group in the 1990s was the group of ecumenical religious writers organized by Richard John Newhouse around the journal First Things. They deplored the secularization of American life and tried to restore the idea, familiar throughout much of American history, that this was a Judeo-Christian society. In a controversial symposium from 1996, they came close to arguing that religious Americans might have to declare war against their own government if it continued to sanction the mass killing of unborn children, a phenomenon they compared to the Nazi Holocaust of the 1940s. Well, the paleoconservatives deplored the new prominence of neoconservative ideas in the 1980s and 90s, and they rallied around Pat Buchanan in the elections first of 1992, as we saw last time, and then again in 1996 and 2000. One group among these paleoconservatives traced its lineage to the Old South and were particularly closely linked with the Southern Agrarians of the 1930s, who'd been one of the groups to speak out against the, what they saw as the excessive materialism of the 1920s. Their journal was The Southern Partisan, founded in 1981. It was very critical of what it called the Yankee conservatism of National Review. And its founders noted that there was, quote, there was no popular voice for the qualities and the values embodied in Southern history. The importance of family life, small communities, local government, honor and manners, the sacred value of the land, the need to nurture the religious roots of the Republic and to keep the old stories alive as a basis for renewal. The Southern Partisan was always vulnerable to the accusation of racial insensitivity and of sentimentalizing the old slave South, and they were never particularly eager to allay those allegations. One of their principal figures was Mel Bradford. He hoped to become their standard bearer inside the federal government, and for a while looked like a possible candidate to become director of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Mel Bradford was a professor at the University of Dallas, formerly a student of one of the agrarians, Donald Davidson, and a scholar of Abraham Lincoln. He was nominated for the NEH, for the National Endowment for the Humanities, in the Reagan years. But neoconservatives spoke out against him. One of them was Irving Kristol. Another of them was George Will, about whom I've so far said very little. George Will was one of the, uh, was one of the new and significant conservative voices in journalism of the 1970s and 80s. He began as National Review's Washington correspondent, sending back regular reports during the Watergate crisis, and then went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for Journalism, which of course made him a major figure in American journalism from then right up to the present. He also was opposed to the idea of having Mel Bradford represent, uh, head the National Endowment of the Humanities. After all, he said, Bradford used to work for George Wallace, the racist candidate in 1968. And Bradford describes Abraham Lincoln not as a hero, but as a tyrant. And this was true, Bradford saw Lincoln as the first in a long line of odious centralizers, and as a president who had usurped the power of the states. His description of Lincoln made Lincoln seem hardly better than a dictatorial war criminal, luring immigrants then from abroad, then sending them into the meat grinder of the Union Army, suppressing habeas corpus and basic civil rights, a violator of the South's right to, se to secede, and an economic centralizer. 
Well, as you can see from this description, Bradford still took very, very much the, the position of the secessionists and thought that they'd been entirely justified and that Lincoln had usurped power and enforced his, uh, his opinions on them unjustifiably by sheer military might. Bradford hated corporate capitalism. He hated the mobility of modern life. And he hated the rhetoric of equality. Looking further back in American history, he regarded the revolution of the 1770s and 80s as a backward-looking event undertaken to restore traditional English liberties and not a forward-looking event inaugurating American democracy. Bradford wrote, Nothing could be more natural than that once we lost one constitution and bill of rights through revolution, an act based on elaborate constitutional arguments, we established another constitution and another Bill of Rights, or rather, several of both, as soon as possible. There is no way of understanding the origins of our fundamental law apart from 18th century English constitutionalism, than which there is no doctrine more conservative. In his view, a deliberate or possibly an accidental misreading of this tradition had distorted it in favour of democracy and in favour of equality. This far-reaching change, he said, based on a misunderstanding of our heritage from the Declaration of Independence and from the Christian promise that grace is available to all, threatens to swallow up our reverence for law, responsible character, moral principle and inherited prescription. Well, that was, that was Mel Bradford. His friend Clyde Wilson was a professor at the University of South Carolina and was the editor of the papers of John C. Calhoun. Calhoun, of course, had been the, the outspoken champion of states' rights, one of the great de intellectual defenders of slavery in the days before the Civil War. So it was highly appropriate that this group, who, who are clinging so hard to the Southern case, should be working with Calhoun. And he agreed in all the essentials with Bradford. Small government and decentralization were vital to America, restoring the legacy of Thomas Jefferson. He agreed that citizens had exchanged virtue, central for uh, a republic, for luxury. And he wrote, the people must not only put limits on government, they must break their own dependence upon the corrupt system, give up the expectation that things will be done for them, and demand the return of our resources to ourselves to dispose of in our own way. I think part of the irony of their position is that these southern paleoconservatives were arguing for a profoundly conservative vision of society by invoking Jefferson, many of whose contemporaries had feared him for what they saw as his excessive radicalism. This is a lovely example of the way in which the symbolic meaning of an individual can change drastically with the passage of time. It's very hard to imagine conservatives in Jefferson's own day seeing him as the conservative champion, but it's certainly possible alike by, by the 20th century for him to be interpreted in that light. In any case, the neoconservative critics hated all this. They did believe in equality and democracy. They proposed that the job at the National Endowment for the Humanities should go to William Bennett instead, and he got the job, causing a lasting legacy of bitterness between the two groups. A second collection of paleoconservatives organised around a journal called Chronicles. These were Midwesterners as opposed to the Southerners. But they also favoured small town decentralised political life. Chronicles of Culture, the, their journal, was founded in 1977 by the Rockford Institute in Illinois. And the principal, the principal figures there were Sam Francis and Thomas Fleming. Francis, in an article from 1986, wrote a rousing defense of Joe McCarthy, the anti-communist uh, Wisconsin senator of the early 1950s, saying that McCarthy had been a militant anti-liberal and that conservatives and right-wingers and right -wingers should still support him today because he was right on all the big issues. Fleming was outspokenly anti-immigrant and almost uh, comparable to Theodore Roosevelt in his admiration for the Anglo-Saxons and for their special virtues. Paul Gottfried, one of their collaborators, agreed, even though he was himself Jewish. And he saw it as, a, as the historically justified view to exclude immigrants, especially immigrants from places which didn't have the Anglo-Saxon traditions in politics. Gottfried wrote, Hamilton, 
Jefferson, Madison, Jay and Franklin all spoke out against liberal immigration and warned against admitting into the New Republic those who had come from cultures markedly different from the one they were entering. Like Pat Buchanan, they wanted a much tougher policy along the Mexican border. Chilton Williamson, another member of this group, noted the paradox that by about 1990, quote, it is considered humanitarian to fret about population growth and its effects on the environment at the global level, but racist, xenophobic, uncompassionate and un-American to worry about the population crisis as it immediately affects the United States, the only place in the world where we are in a position to do anything about it. So in other words, in Williamson's view, if we're serious about the dangers of overpopulation, we can stop it right here and now by not letting anybody else into the United States. Well, rebukes like this are rebukes both to liberals and to neoconservatives because they generally favoured an open immigration policy. They were very confident of the assimilative powers of America. And very often from their own family histories, they could see that their ancestors, one or two or three generations back, mainly Jewish and Catholic immigrants from Europe, had in fact assimilated and given them, the children and grandchildren, the opportunity to thrive in America. So they also tended to take the view that more population is a greater source of wealth and therefore should be welcomed. These kind of disputes came to a head at a 1986 meeting of the Philadelphia Society and many smouldering resentments between the neo and the paleoconservatives came briefly out into the open. A paleoconservative speaker named Stephen Tonsor, he was a professor of history at the University of Michigan, made a great outburst against the former leftists who were now neoconservatives. And here's what he said. It is splendid when the town whore gets religion and joins the church. Now and then she makes a good choir director. But when she begins to tell the minister what he ought to say in his Sunday sermons, matters have been carried too far. So the old town whore is the neoconservatives, as he saw it. Tonsor accused the neoconservatives of being far too complacent about the growth of the welfare state and of being, quote, global democrats and secularists whose democratic universalism was reminiscent of Trotskyist utopianism. And of course he knew perfectly well that many of them in the 1930s during their own youth had in fact been Trotskyists. He also thought that religion was central to conservatism and that the neoconservatives, whatever their religious origins, were, were now too secular, too much beholden to radical modernism to be convincing as conservatives. Tonsor carried on in this way. Halfway from modernity is not far enough. Politics has always been inseparable from culture and both derive ultimately from religion. It is absurd to believe that one can remain a modernist in culture and reject the implications of modernism in politics. Unbelief is incompatible with conservatism. Conserve what and to what end? Well, that's an unusual point of view. The claim that you really can't be conservative if you're not religious. Not many others in any part of the movement were willing to go to, the, to that uh, position with Stephen Tonsor. Libertarians, another conservative grouping, saw the end of the Cold War as an opportunity to revive their fortunes and to begin dismantling the great warfare state, the military-industrial complex. Murray Rothbard had been discouraged by the Libertarian Party's inability to attract voters and he hoped that now it was going to be possible to improve its image by making an alliance with other conservative groups. The problem for the Libertarians was that during the 1960s they periodically had alliances with parts of the New Left. I mentioned this previously that for a while the anarcho-capitalists had had a, a, a meeting of minds with the anarcho-syndicalists and it was the extreme left and the extreme right because they both agreed over the tyranny of the American government in the Vietnam War and in compelling people to join the army in the draft. And the libertarians had never entirely been able to shake the hippie associations that some libertarians had certainly had in the 1960s. It was a constant struggle for them to be respectable. At a meeting in 1989 at Rockford, 
Libertarians and paleoconservatives together founded another new grouping, the John Randolph Club. That is, naming themselves after the, the uh, defender of Southern tradition, John Randolph of Roanoke, whose work we investigated much earlier in this course. Llewellyn Rockwell of the Ludwig von Mises Center at the University of Alabama, or of Auburn University, I should say, combined libertarian economic ideas with cultural conservatism and sympathized with Rothbard's general outlook. So although uh, on the face of it, uh, traditionalists and libertarians still had differences, they could understand the benefits of, of uniting, particularly because they all understood that the two-party electoral system in the United States strongly disfavors third parties. And that if you want to be serious about ever mounting a, a campaign, you've got to build up alliances rather than have the constant fragmentation, which is the, always the temptation among people who are looking for ideological purity. Libertarians remained very active in politics in the 1990s and into the new century, and occasionally they influenced Republican policy questions. But their profound hostility to the modern state made them marginal from centers of power and influence. Even somebody like President Reagan, despite his intention of beginning to break down the, the great state, had actually proved unable to do it. Once bureaucracies exist, they fight very tenaciously indeed to retain their existence and politicians will hardly ever risk exhausting themselves and making themselves unpopular in the act of trying to get rid of them. So they tend to stay once they're there. And libertarians more and more um, had to struggle against the imputation that they were simply utopian in their idea that the, the government could shrink. Another group, different again, was the theoconservatives. These were religious intellectuals with a more cerebral approach to politics than that of the new Christian right. And they became more influential in the 1990s because really of the work of one man, Richard John Newhouse. As I mentioned previously, after the evangelical scandals of the late 80s, the events uh, surrounding Jimmy Swaggart and Jim and Tammy Baker, the moral majority had shut down in 1989, but Ralph Reed's Christian coalition took over working hard to build a grassroots constituencies and to run their candidates very hard at the level of school boards and local city, government, city and county governments. The problem was that it was intellectually a bit thin. They were interested in the work of Francis Schaeffer. Many of them were enthusiastic about C.S. Lewis and they were great readers of Bibles. But it seemed as though many of their members were more interested in, more interested in banning sexy books from libraries than they were in reading good ones. Now, in order to understand the next anecdote, I must remind you that Al Gore's wife, Tipper Gore, was herself involved in a movement towards library censorship or labeling materials which might be uh, troublesome to children. The paleoconservative Thomas Fleming made this remark. He said, if the library refused a hundred requests for Goethe or Bishop Berkeley, then it would be time to accuse the library of censorship. After decades of efforts to ban nasty books, rape movies, and put warning labels on records, the Tipper Gores of America have contributed nothing, literally nothing positive to our culture. This was an important point, that uh, particularly in the New Christian Rite, there wasn't a very rich intellectual tradition. It tended to be a defiant assertion of, of simple populist answers and a, and a ready reliance on the Bible, having none of the richness that other parts of the conservative movement certainly showed. And as I want to indicate now, the theoconservatives in this respect were something new. Now, Catholics had always played a prominent role in the conservative movement since World War II, and I've given many examples of that. People like William Buckley Jr. himself, uh, uh, whose Catholic faith was very, very serious to him his brother-in-law Brent Bazell, Michael Novak who wrote The Rise of the Unmeltable Eth Ethnics and The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, Russell Kirk and Geoffrey Hart, both of whom were converts, and many others. There's a prominent Catholic role in the movement. And now they were about to acquire a powerful new ally. Richard Newhouse was a former radical. In the 1960s he'd been a, an outspoken opponent of the Vietnam War. He was a Lutheran minister. But in the 1980s, he published two influential books on religion and politics, uh, showing that his, his thinking was changing. The first one was called The Naked Public Square from 1984, and the second one was called The Catholic Moment from 1987. The first of these books was a lament at the excessive secularization of the United States. 
Newhouse said, the First Amendment was never meant to exclude religion from public life. It was written only to prevent any one church from becoming dominant over all the other Christians. But, he said, recent Supreme Court decisions have now forced Christianity out of public life while authorising hedonism and permissive sexuality. Liberal democracy is in danger if there are no fundamental points of agreement and if religion, which asks questions of ultimate concern, is no longer allowed to participate. Here's a passage from his book, The Naked Public Square. The case can be made that the great social and political devastations of our century have been perpetrated by regimes of militant secularism, notably those of Hitler, Stalin and Mao. That is true, and it suggests that the naked public square is a dangerous place. When religious transcendence is excluded, when the public square has been swept clean of divisive sectarianisms, the space is opened to seven demons aspiring to transcendent authority. Our question can certainly not be the old one of whether religion and politics should be mixed. They inescapably do mix, like it or not. The question is whether we can devise forms for that interaction which can revive rather than destroy the liberal democracy that is required by a society, by a society that would be pluralistic and free. In the Catholic moment, the second of these books, he argued that the Catholic Church, because of its rich intellectual heritage, was ideally equipped to address all these questions, especially in the age of Pope John Paul II, the Polish figure who, around whom anti-communist Christians had rallied, and particularly after the Second Vatican Council of the 1960s, which had purged the Catholic Church of much of its old intolerance. Newhouse said, Catholicism, better than any other church, has a beautiful balance of reason and revelation. It has a long tradition of natural law teaching, which certainly appeals most deeply to people of faith, but is also explicable to people whatever their metaphysical views. It has a complicated and very well worked out theory relating to just war. And the papal encyclical letters, the letters of advice um, written extensively over the last century on the crucial issues of our time, have built up a, a fund of wisdom which can be used to good effect by all conservatives. Well, it might seem unusual that a Lutheran minister should write so enthusiastically about Catholicism, but perhaps he resolved the paradox by himself converting to Catholicism and almost at once training and taking the vows of be and becoming a Catholic priest. Newhouse had long been a celibate, even as a Lutheran, and so this transition was relatively straightforward. It would have been more complicated had he been married, as Lutheran clergy are entitled to be. After separating from the Rockford Institute, he founded First Things in 1990. In the 80s, his Centre on Religion and Society, uh, found, uh, set in New York, had been funded by the Rockford Institute, which also ran Chronicles. But Newhouse himself didn't like Chronicles, particularly he didn't like its xenophobic attitude to foreigners, to immigrants, and, it, and he didn't like its vulnerability to charges of anti-Semitism. He was himself outspoken in favour of ecumen ecumenism, bringing members of the different religions together. And so he criticised what he called the magazine's indulgence in nativism and its increasingly shrill and mean-spirited war on conservatives who did not pass its ideological tests. A crisis came in 1989 when the Rockford uh, executives ejected Newhouse from his New York offices. He literally came to work one morning and found that he'd been locked out and that essentially all the stuff from his office had been put out on the street, that the, dis the dispute between them had become uh, too acute. The mainstream media followed this spat among right-wing groups with great interest. Major funding came from the Bradley Foundation and uh, now that Rockford and Newhouse were splitting, the Bradley Foundation decided that it was going to stay with Newhouse. Of the two, it preferred Newhouse's outlook. And a spokesman for the foundation said, Rockford, particularly its magazine Chronicles, is somewhat critical of free markets and, and spreading democracy. It looks back to agrarian society, small towns, religious values. It sees modern times as too secular, too democratic. There's a distrust of cities and of, of cultural pluralism, which they find partly responsible for social decay in American life. 
So the Bradley Foundation came down against Rockford and in favour of Newhouse. First thing, says New Journal, gave prominence to such evangelical activists as the former Watergate conspirator Charles Colson, who had been through a profound conversion experience while he was in prison and had begun an evangelical prison ministry and was a major figure in the evangelical world of the 1980s and 90s. But also to Jewish writers like Rabbi David Novak. It was, it was central to Newhouse's position that all the members of the Judeo-Christian churches could collaborate and that the things they held together in common easily outweighed the things that kept them apart. He agreed with the Christian coalition that the defeat of communism was only half the battle and that they also had to overcome decadence and immorality inside America itself. He deplored abortion, hated the normalization of homosexuality and disliked the American refusal to condemn people whose misconduct had led them to contracting AIDS. Obviously AIDS was another of the great issues of the 1980s and 90s. And Newhouse's view was this, we must hate the sin and love the sinner. But that doesn't mean we've got to abdicate our moral responsibility. The people who contract AIDS, he said, have done things which they ought not to have done, and we ought to be much more willing to condemn them for it. He was, he was horrified, as I, I mentioned, at the normalization of homosexuality. Newhouse himself, with Charles Colson, collaborated on the 1994 statement Evangelicals and Catholics Together, emphasizing their shared heritage and shared concerns. This was one of many signs of rapprochement on the right. Uh, before 1960, the idea of Protestants and, and Catholics collaborating had been almost impossible to imagine. In those days, especially before the election of President Kennedy, anti-Catholicism was a very active force in American life. But by the 80s and 90s, a shared belief that America faced a moral crisis had brought them together. This had been very, very plain in Operation Rescue, the anti-abortion movement during the late 1980s. Theoconservatives raised the possibility that the government's complicity with abortion might force them to abandon America. First Things held a symposium called The End of Democracy, the Judicial Usurpation of Politics in 1996. And it argued very much along the lines earlier uh, worked out by Brent Bazell and Robert Bork that the Supreme Court had usurped the legislative function on behalf of a radical agenda promoting immorality. The symposium began like this. Law, as it is presently made by the judiciary, has declared its independence from morality. Indeed, morality, especially traditional morality, and most especially morality associated with religion, has been declared legally suspect and a threat to public order. Soon, said the contributors to this symposium, citizens were going to have to choose not God and country, but God or country, an incredible position to be put in. One of the contributors to the uh, symposium was Robert George, a professor of politics at Princeton University. And here's his response to the Supreme Court's position on abortion. He wrote, It is not merely that the claim of these justices to have found a pro-abortion mandate in the Constitution is manifestly ludicrous. The value of constitutional democracy lies ultimately in its capacity to serve and secure the common good, which demands above all the protection of fundamental human rights. If the Constitution really did abandon the vulnerable to private acts of lethal violence and indeed positively disempowered citizens from working through the democratic process to correct these injustices, then it would utterly lack the capacity to bind the consciences of citizens. Taking the view, in other words, that it might be m immoral to regard oneself as bound by the uh, declarations of the Supreme Court. Well, that in turn brought forth irritated rejoinders from more secular conservatives, including William Bennett, who pointed out that America did have a political system that was responsive to citizens' initiatives and concerns, and that working within the system could still change the situation. The position of the symposium also infuriated Gertrude Himmelfarber, historian, another prominent neoconservative, who said that slavery, bad as it was, had not delegitimated the Constitution itself, and neither should abortion. Well, the theoconservatives and the paleoconservatives, plus the unassimilated libertarians, showed that there was plenty of internal conflict in the American conservative movement in the 1980s and 90s.
And this underlined the possibility that the end of the Cold War had removed the one vital rallying point of anti-communism.